everybody. Welcome again to our next uh, High Performance Lila webinar series. We've had some really great guests from the Minnesota Vikings, Golden State Warriors, Paris St. Germain. But at the top of the heap in the world of sport is always speed. And we've, uh, we've developed a very unique partnership with one of the very best speed coaches in the world, Coach Dennis Mitchell, who's currently out there in Florida. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, it's my pleasure, man. It's um, now for those of you who don't know, I think most of you know Dennis uh, through a very illustrious career, both as an athlete and a coach. He's a three time Olympian from 88 to 96, uh, won medals in all three uh, ranges, bronze, silver, and gold. So he's got a it's got some very nice hardware with there. And of course, this is in the sprint and speed category as one of the very best sprinters in the world in his day. He is currently one of Nike's top speed coaches out of the USA and has been a, the relays coach for USA track and field as well. So we're really excited to have literally one of the best speed coaches, speed athletes, who certainly knows the game of speeds uh, today with us. Um, before we get started, Dennis, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Again, where your program is right now and um, what you're doing right now. Well, I mean, right now we're in, a, in the off season. Uh, my athletes had a, a really good season. I'm, I'm very, very proud of what they did. Um, I took uh, five athletes to the Olympics. Uh, four of them were newbies. Um, and we came home with six medals. Um, so that's enough for a, a small country, I think. Yeah. It was a pretty, pretty, pretty good haul. Yeah. As, as far as the season, you know, we, we all had a really good season. Um, there's too much stuff that we accomplished through the season to all name here. Um, but I mean, my, my fastest girl was 10, seven, my fastest guy in 200 was, uh, 196, 1968. Um, my fastest girl in, in the, 200 I think was 22 flat um and I had three or four guys go under 10 seconds uh through the season so we had a very very productive season and you've got a really big mix there as well I know you talked about talk Tokyo you've got some of the senior guys the biggest names in the business people like Justin Gatlin and then the newcomers coming up like Shakari so it's I have a, I, I always wonder do you struggle with that range? Because, I mean, a sprinting is an individual game, right? But you're talking about 10, 15 more and more years between athletes. You know, young athletes coming up in their 2021, you've got a senior guy who's still breaking out records and winning in his late 30s. You know, it's a, it's a, it's, is, is it difficult to work with that range? Well, with that particular range, yes. Uh, because Justin, you know, he'll be pushing 40 years old this year. Yeah, crazy. And Shakiri she'll be 22. Um, and the difficulty between the two is, you know, Shakira's body is, is pretty much brand new to the game, you know? So I have a lot more flexibility to do certain things with her. Mm. Justin's body, you know, has a lot of wear and tear on it. So we have to approach our training in a very, very specific way. Right. Um, last year, we didn't quite get there. Uh, we had too many, you know, knickknack injuries, but I think, you know, with some of the, additions to my group this year will uh you know fix some of the things moving forward and hopefully we can uh get justin to be you know the fastest man in the history of the planet at age 40. that's incredible but you're right uh, you know when you've got a young athlete like shakiri there their body you don't even know what works yet like we were saying this is just raw speed talent and of course there's been some good coaching through those years but now they're coming into that adult body Justin, and, and at that level, they know what works, they know what don't, and you're, and you're micromanaging those small issues constantly, right? But yeah, keeping them healthy is really important because the, at that age, not only do those niggles come more often, but they take more time. Right, they, they absolutely do. And, uh, you know, as Justin, you know, gets older, you know, we are increasingly going into more and more uncharted territory, um, you know, I'm, I'm not the type of coach that is going to think that or make people think that I know everything. Uh, so with him, you know, we're in a learning, learning process and we're learning sometimes day to day, you know, what his body can and cannot do. Um, so it's a, it's a job upon me to be able to find the things that he does well, find the uh, uh, types of equipment that he can use that helps him train in a more direct manner. Uh, because, you know, he's not the type of athlete that's going to go around the track, 
you know, and kind of get things more holistically. We have to be more strategic in our approach and, and how we train them. So, you know, I have to actually humble myself to the process of training an athlete that's that's going to be 40 years old. Yeah. And, and, and what's exciting, though, is he's still hitting those times. You know, there's, this is not some pipe dream. You know, this is a reality. And I guess that's also a credit to the type of athlete is, you know, staying healthy and being smart in his career to even be thinking about this goal. It's, it's pretty fantastic. But, but that's changing. You know, like the world's changing. You know, 40 is the new 30. And, and it's, <laughs> it's different. You didn't talk about 30 years ago. You weren't talking about 40-year-old sprinters at the Olympics. You know, now... Well, well, you know, it, it's funny because uh, when when I was a younger athlete and I'm talking, you know, 18, 19 years old, you know, in sprinting, 23, 24 was old. Yeah, yeah. You know, those guys were retiring around that time. You know yeah. what I mean? And then the addition of Carl and Calvin Smith, you know, they pushed it into, you know, the early, late 20s, early 30s. And then my generation kind of pushed it a few years later. But now, you know, heck, we're in uncharted territory well, there was i mean the, the, in tokyo more than anything there was athletes in the 40s and 50s competing in sports that yeah. like you said 30 years ago the 20s was old and and they're yeah. just they're showing up they're competitive you know they're still in top three they're in metal contentions maybe at a bronze level maybe not it's still a goal but some of them are still pushing that there was one woman in the gymnastics i think she'd been in eight seven or eight olympics or five six yeah. olympics and it was yeah. And that's fantastic because these are high speed power sports. We're not talking about endurance running or sports where shooting or other sports where, you know, it doesn't have that wear and tear where you're in that speed and power game. It, it's a different game, but, but something yes. you said, one of the reasons we're able to do it for sure, better training techniques, you know, smarter recovery, nutrition is helping, but embracing new technology. And, and we want to talk a little bit about that today um, because, you know, obviously we're having this conversation because, almost a year ago, you approached us and you'd found out a little mm -hmm. bit about us. And I just wanted to ask, you remember, what was it about uh, Lila, the, the company you didn't know, but the product, Exigen, the wearable resistance. When you first saw it, what were you thinking? And you hadn't used it yet, but you reached out and said, hey, uh, and I remember it because you were very interested in getting some kit to buy. And I said, never mind that, let's get a partnership. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was... Um... You know, I'm, I'm friends with with an athlete that's there with you now, Dwayne. And, uh, you know, he he kind of introduced me to the product and he explained it to me, but I really couldn't kind of grasp what it was. So I kind of looked online. I looked on YouTube and I saw a couple of you guys' videos and I said, you know what? This is what I need. Um, you know, I'm always looking for, you know, the next thing to be able to, one, help my athletes to be able to train without the advent of added injury. You yep. know, we can bring as coaches, we can bring 10 different types of things into our training, but the more things you bring in, the more uh, uh, coaching techniques you bring in, the, the higher your, your injury rate in your group is going to go up because the body can only handle so much. Mm -hmm. So I understand that. So when I saw Leela, I was like, okay, this is a pinpointed type of thing that I can use my athletes. And I know just by looking at it, it has been designed to maintain athletes and keep them, you know, with a very, very low injury rate. So that was the first thing, um, because to get the things like weight on the body, you know, us as coaches, you know, there's a combination between us being old school and new school. The old school way of, of wearables when it comes to weight is a gigantic weight vest, yeah, you yeah. know, or pulling, you know, Big, 90, heavy, 100 weight or everything you know and you know this is the kind of thing that at least I was raised in you know and and also pulling sleds yeah. you know being able to get the thing you know uh to get the power out of an athlete you have to almost you know put you know 90 100 pounds on them and you know have them pull it for a, sh a sh certain uh, distance but at the end of the day you know with all of those things there is a wear and tear on the joints there's a wear and tear on the soft tissue so when I saw Leela, I was like, okay, this fixes all of that. And I was very, very excited to try to get in contact with you guys to try to bring this into my group. Because once again, I'm, I'm always looking at the injury rate of things that, that my athletes expose themselves to in terms of the way that I train them. So with looking at this product, 
that's the very first thing that I looked at. It's like, I can train these athletes in an even higher manner and also decrease their, their rate of injury. So yeah. I was all in before I even talked to you. <laughs> yeah. And I know a couple of points. I want to pick up on that injury issue because we get asked that a lot as a company, but uh, you're right. The coach you were talking about was Dwayne Miller. Uh, Dwayne Miller, yeah. who uh, is a good friend of yours. He's also a USA's track and field level coach. He coached LaShawn yeah. Merricks in the yeah. 92, 96 Olympics. I think when he'd won his gold, now yeah, he works. 92. And yeah, uh, Dwayne and I have become quite good friends because he's come over. He's now head of the sprint program for the Malaysia National Sports Council. So mm -hmm. um, Dwayne, if you're listening, thanks so much for the connection. That's right. Uh, he's And he uses it a lot here. He, and, and like you, again, the, the nice, the, what's interesting is I, I'm, I'm an SNC coach, strength and conditioning and what, what I would call now a high performance or a movement coach. And before, when I created the product, it was literally, you talked about the sled. I was training at that time. I wasn't training. I was working with the sprint coach who at that time was also a, a, a very good sprint coach, but we were training the Southeast Asian sprint champion. So he was the sort of the Carl Lewis of Southeast Asia, 100, 200, uh, four by one in the long jump champ. He was a very competent, about a 10-2 sprinter. Uh, so a good level. He's the kind of guy as an Asian athlete, I think he had the ability to go under 10, but he was happy with his success at the time and ended up retiring. Mm -hmm. But we were preparing for Athens. So we were working with him on the track preparing for Athens, Athens qualification. And we were pulling a sled and, and the coach and I were sitting there and I'm, I'm I was a very hands-on type of SNC guy. I was always there at training with the athletes and coaches. And we were just looking at the sled and there was that constant cueing, you know, because when you pull the sled, then you have to remind the athlete how to run properly because the sled, yes. you know, and, and so the mind is just overwhelmed by, you know, stand straight, stay tall, forward foot, you know, all those little things. But no matter what he does, he's pulling something rather than sprinting. And I literally was looking at him and his body and he had these tights on. And I remember thinking, if you could just wrap weight around those tights, around those glutes, around those hips, around those calves, so he could run normally. That's like I said, I knew the weight training was helping, but it was the wrong tool of weight training. And I'm not saying a sled doesn't have purpose, but it was the mechanics we were trying to figure out. And I went home that night and that started 17 years of trying to get this product to create it to put weight on the body and essentially that's what it was and you you saw that right this was right. this was weight training but something you mentioned is weight training was always about the muscle but now with exogen it's about the movement and here we are we're talking to a coach not an snc coach only and so maybe you could share a little bit about how what you thought when you when you realized we could start adding weight on the body for technique which is a very different concept than just the heavy weighted vest was designed just to load, right? It did nothing, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't specifically targeting mechanics. It wasn't doing anything along those lines. It was just making everything harder. And in some cases, disrupting the mechanics. But so what did you think when you saw, you know, the ability to start tweaking? Because in our first calls, that, those were your first questions, right? Right. Your mechanics, right. Uh end, back end, where do we load? Well, for me, you know, when I'm using uh, sleds or any type of resistance type training, the very first thing that I'm going after is technique, okay? Um, I know just by having a weighted vest or a sled behind you that you're going to create some type of power. And if you do it consistently enough, it's going to give you an amount of power in your, your foot strike or, or push off the ground, whatever you're trying to achieve. You know, but for me, I'm more of a technical person. I'm not so much of, uh, you know, how much can you pull or how much load can you put on the body? It's more, can you have the proper technique? My thing is being able to create acceleration. Yeah. And you have to have good technique and necessary to have acceleration, especially in a start or your dry fix. You have to have good technique in order to, uh, accelerate properly or create the, the, the most acceleration. So when I saw Leela, I said, well, this falls right into my, my, my wheelhouse because as a coach, it's going to allow for me to allow the athlete to concentrate on technique more and not so much as a pulling a weight or having an unnecessary amount of load put on their shoulders or their back. Um, so I said, this is the perfect thing for me because I can teach, now I can 
flip the script a little bit and not so much putting so much weight on them and focusing on technique. But now I can focus in on the technique first. Yes. And not so much the load. Yeah. You know, I can use the load as a secondary thing in order to get the athlete to be able to create one great technique and two, the proper uh, uh, technique to be able to accelerate well. So this is what sparked everything with me. And that's why when I, I, I talked to you first on, on, what was it, on Skype? Yeah, Skype. You know, I was asking all these, all these technical questions yeah. because I was like, look, I got to get these questions answered because if I'm right, this is the perfect thing for me. Yeah. So that's kind of what happened with me. And, 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 and what's exciting is now, because I invented this, I was trying to make a better weight training tool. But what, what that first discovery I had is once we started tweaking, we created this system, literally, you know, you could put as little as four ounces, two to four ounces anywhere in the body. We were starting to tweak the body. And, and what I found out was as an s &C guy, I thought it was making just a better version of a weight vest, right? But coaches didn't see that at all. I would go into coaches and I would talk to them from a strength and conditioning perspective. And they're like, dude, I'm not even thinking that. I'm looking at her ankle rotation and I want to get the weight in there to help that rotation because that's the final part of the spin or the movement. And, and I was sitting there and in that first couple of years, I was like, weight training is no longer about strength and conditioning. It's about coaching now. And we're mm -hmm. tweaking movements. And, and that became, I, I would like to say that I thought about that at the start, but I didn't, you know, I, and my biggest challenge was when I created the system, it was hard to get too much weight on it. So I thought nobody's going to use it. Because you know what, weight wet, weight vests weigh 10, 20, 30, 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. But then I realized no. And everybody was saying, Joe, you don't need more weight. And you said that now several times, the right amount of weight, the specific weight. And the second thing you said a couple of times is, so I can get the athlete to do this. It's not forcing them. The product, we always say the product is the educator because the athlete also knows what they feel, right? They know positions. They know what you're trying to work on. And so what I've found working with programs around the world is it becomes a communication tool now. You know, you put loads on certain areas and athletes all of a sudden like, oh, I'm really aware of that leg. Now I know what that hip's supposed to feel like. And I remember the last point you made was you talked about the load being heavy. And I remember we had our, we were doing a, our sort of regular calls before Tokyo, right? I think once every couple of weeks, we we're starting you out. And I said, 100 to 200 grams, you know, 48 ounces, that's all the start. And I think you said it was Justin or somebody had put it on, went for run, one run, came back and said, no, nah, coach, this is heavier than you think. And, yeah. you, and yeah. you said to me, no, you were right. We got to start light. And do you remember that? Because that was really that first that's play time. That, yeah, that's exactly right. And it wasn't just Justin. It was probably four or five of my guys that did that. Um, you know, because, you know, when I pulled this product out, you know, they're athletes. So they're going to go directly for the heaviest weight possible. Yep. Because their manhood is on the Give line, you know what I mean? Give it to me, I can load up. <laughs> you, know, you know, so, you know, we had to have a discussion, you know, like you told me, try to get these guys to start a little lighter, you know, but some of these guys wanted to be gung-ho. So we put a little bit more weight on there and they came back and said, okay, you can take it off now. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, when you're moving 100 meters at the fastest speed possible, eight ounces becomes heavy and they come back. And, and I've seen it. I can go on with stories about this for hours, but literally everybody does that. And I think also because, you know, we spent a lot of time on the design, maybe you could comment is it's not a weighted vest. It's not bouncing around. It's not disturbing everything. It's not sliding up and down. It's in there. It's wrapped around. And as soon as you put it on, you, you forget about it and the weight doesn't feel heavy. So you forget it's there, but then you start moving and sprinting and going through your real routine and your body says, yeah, there is something here. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Um, you know, when my athletes put, a, put, put it on for the first time, uh, you know, that's one of the things that they were concerned about is especially with the calf ones, they didn't want it to be able to move around. Yeah. But once they got it on, they saw the fit, you know, everything worked perfect and, you know, they adapted very well to it. The other thing I want to say is they also adapted well to the weight. Uh, when we started off with the lighter weight, you know, they progress to heavier weight much quicker than I thought they would. Mm. Um, now, some of them, I did move the weight up and some of them I didn't because 
you know, I didn't think it was the weight that was actually what we needed. I thought it was more of them being able to control or accentuate a certain movement. That's the technique, so Once right? I got that movement, yeah, that's the technique. So once I got the technique, I kept the weight the same. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned that because some of our guidelines and, and are, are always that, never sacrifice technique and speed for load. And now we have a product where you don't have to do that. And so if you load too much and you notice, we say technique should be challenged but not compromised. And we finally have a tool that allows that because the weight is light and it's specific and it's wrapped around the body. And we, we get asked that question a lot, like, how do you know when it's too much? I said, it's very simple. This is a qualitative tool. You've got to focus on quality. They'll know when they're running, they'll say, wow, I'm really having to work hard. Like, let's say you've got on the shorts for a hip engagement or a high knee position. They know when it's challenging them and when they're turning around saying, yeah, I can't even lift my hip now. And the difference is only a few ounces. And that's one thing we talk about a lot is don't move away from the coaching. Don't make it just another heavy tool right? Because we have, we have those already. Like you said, you do something heavy, you gain some consistency and power, but now we have to do something with that power or it won't change the race time. Right. And that's exactly the way I looked at it. I did not want to use this as a tool just to put added weight. I wanted to keep the coaching aspect of what I could do with this product first and foremost. So you know, very early on when we started using this, I was not one of those coaches that wanted to go out and just keep putting weight on because the athlete wanted to get it. You know, I wanted to keep coaching and the athlete learning and, and using this tool for them to learn their bodies and stay connected to it also neuromuscularly. Um, and I thought that was, you know, the environment where I wanted to live. And you said something interesting about the athlete connecting because all correction is self-correction, right? Coaches are guides. Right to help athletes self-correct and self-learn. And, and you said, when they, we put that load in a position, the athlete becomes aware of it. Now when they go run and sprint and move, they become aware of it even more. And you said they connect neuromuscularly. Is that something you knew the product was gonna do or, or, or you thought it was gonna do and then you saw it happening? I mean, you share just, cause that's a really critical part, right? That's essentially coaching. Well, in the beginning, when I first saw the product, I said that this would probably be the product that could do that for me. I didn't know right off, right off the bat because, you know, with, with anything, you have to get it, you know, on the ground and try it out. But, but once I got this product and my athletes started using it, they started talking more about the neuromuscular uh, part of what the devices oh. were giving them, be especially with the knee to ankle movement. That's one of the most critical areas. Which one? Knee to ankle? Knee to ankle. Yeah. Right. Um, it's one of the most critical areas and the most, the, the most area that an athlete is not connected to. Like if you tell them, hey, your knees aren't coming up high enough, they usually can say, okay, I can go back and feel a higher knee. Right. But if you tell them, hey, your knee to ankle is cycling through too fast, it's kicking out too far or it's rising up too high, you know, they really don't feel that most of the time. Somebody like a Justin, yes. But, you know, that, that's one out of 14 athletes that I, that I, I train. Well, actually, it's two of them that can feel that. Um, but everybody else, as soon as we put this on, now they could feel that part of their body, and they were more excited about it. Because right. now they can feel it. They can feel how it movement. They can feel the rotation. And it, it, it gave them the opportunity to be able to, you know, feel the good things and feel the bad things that they were doing in a sprint. And which is, which is connecting, right? What you're constantly doing with an athlete right. is trying to get them connect to their body so they can change a movement and, and, and improve a, some aspects of movement. And, and it's a very difficult thing to do because in coaching, our keys to connecting are words, something slow. We can touch the body. We can pick up their leg and say, this is what I want. But the moment you stop talking and you back off and they try and do it at high speed, you know, they're processing something changes. But <clears throat> what we see quite a bit is now you can put the load there and let the load be the cue. That, and we hear, right. this, we hear this a lot. People like combat sports, we hear it a lot. People say they don't talk to us about, I was just looking at some videos we got from a UFC fighter that's fighting in the big card coming up at uh, UFC two, uh, 268. We've got a partnership with the UFC PI as well. And from a lot of these fighters, we, like you, they don't say, oh, I've got more power. You know, 
power comes from the heavy work. But what they'll say is, I like the control I'm getting on my striking now. I'm liking the stability. I'm liking the focus and, and sort of technique. And, and I think this is just a really new area that we're getting to explore with, with wearable resistance as opposed to like traditional resistance. And this is that fine tuning. Now, something else you said, talking about connection, because uh, we're still kind of talking about your first experience with the product and some of the things you thought. And I remember, I can't remember if it was Justin, it was one of the guys, but you said they immediately connected, and this was about the loading on off, right? Because the other thing that happens mm -hmm. is that connection really changes. So you load them up, something specific, you work on that. And as I talk to you, you know, you always finish light so the body can reconnect. Then the athlete takes that weight off and all of a sudden that weight's not there. Now you've got these limbs just moving at hyper speeds and you can feel that sort of connection and getting that, re that, that, that potentiation. And, and I'd like you to comment on that, but something very specific happened. I think it was Justin, one of the guys said, dude, this is great for warmups. I'm taking this for race warmup, just, just to create that over speed or that feeling of speed. You remember that? I remember because again, that was- <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, once the once these guys started wearing this at a consistent level, then they started bringing me the ideas of what they thought they could use it for, which is good. Once you once you start that that communication between athlete and coach, and you're both on the same page with the same thing, you know, that's a great great coaching moment. You know, when you can get on the same page with an athlete like that. Um, so it. it it actually helped me be able to not just with Justin, with all of them, you know, they all wanted to take it to Europe with them and, you know, use it in their warmups. Um, and I let some of them do it and some of them I didn't, honestly, um, because some of them are smarter with it than others. Be, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, you know, I could have one athlete take it. And if I say, Hey, only use this in your warm up or use it pre meet, whatever. And then you have another athlete that's in the hallways of the hotel, you know, doing high knees, you know, Extra. for two hours, yeah, you yeah. know, be the day before a track meet. So you got to be careful <laughs> of those kinds of things, you, you know, but yeah, this, this thing, this thing really sparked the interest in what the athlete thought they could use it for, you know, which, which again, in the coaching world, that's perfect. So in that first experience, you know, we, we, we before Tokyo, it was really just play time, right? That's where we, you guys had a chance. I said, let's, uh, you were excited to get started with the guys. People started to get that feedback. You started to see that interaction. I just want to ask your thought on did Cause at first, once you start talking about putting loads in specific places of the body, what I found is the audiences often get very scared. They're like, Oh, I don't know where to load. Cause it's sort of like looking at a weight training bar for the first time and showing them a list of a hundred exercises. They're like, I don't know how to do snatches. I don't know how to do cleans. I don't know how to do any of that. Someone's got to teach me. So it can be pretty daunting to think, well, did I put the road in the long, wrong place, the right place? And I tell people, I say, look, it's simpler than you think. Like you, I kind of walked you through the loading profiles, right? I said, you can load on the front, the back, you can load sort of proximal and distal to the joint, and you can load sort of internal and external. And just play with that your first session. And then you'll once you play with it, the athlete picks it up like that. Now, I just want to get your comment on it can seem like an, a, 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 a complicated system to use, but once you get feeling it, it's pretty simple. Well, the thing that kept it very simple with me is that I said, okay, I'm bringing this device into my training. What do I want to get out of this technically? And what problems do I have yeah. in, my, in my athletes as a whole technically? And then it was easy. It was easy to put certain loads on certain parts of the body. It was easy to do it as a group because as a group, as a coach, I should know what are my problems there. And then individually, it was easy because once you identify a technical flaw in an athlete, then you can understand how to put the load on the body to be able to help an athlete be able to be connected to, um, you know, that part of the body that you're trying to accentuate it at any given time. So it's not that difficult. You just to, as a coach, you have to know what you're going after and what you want to achieve by using this product. And that makes it simple at that point. It's funny you say that. I just did a big uh, seminar 
somewhere. I, mean, I can't remember where. It might have been in Thailand with a bunch of high-level coaches, and many of them were golf. And I told them, they started asking about, well, you know, coaches are different, right? One coach will say, I like the top. That's where all the mechanics happen. Someone else will say it's the arms. Another one will say the calves. I actually say you're all right. You know, you just have your own way. Yeah. And, um, That's right. But, but, and I, but I was telling them, I said, don't overcomplicate it. It's like coaching. Imagine an athlete coming in in one day and you're working block start, acceleration, transition, and finishing speed. And you've got 45 minutes. That athlete's just going to be confused. And so I, I would say, just pick one product, one problem, and work on that for a block of time. You've got an athlete that wants to engage, you know, they're working on a bit of stride length, maybe in the early part of the race. Then just get calf sleeves. Here's your loading pattern at the back of the leg. The only thing you have to control then is how often do you do that? You know, right. and you need to, so you, and, and the same thing, you kind of still need a day of recovery. Don't do it every day. It's lightweight training, but it's still weight training. And so, yeah, like I said, I just, I think that's a really good point is keep it simple and focus on one thing. Because what I have seen too, you know, as a company, obviously we'd love people to have multiple pieces of the product, but not a lot of athletes train with, you might train with two pieces, like a sprinter might have a workout with cap and shorts. Once they got used to the product, correct? But then a top might be a whole different workout. Like that could be a whole different mm -hmm. block. I mean, maybe just a little comment or your thought on that, you know, keeping it simple, focus on one thing. Yeah, that, that's the key is to keep it simple. And like I said, if you can, as a coach, if you can stay focused in what you're trying to achieve, and like you said, your example with the tennis coaches, you know, all of them are probably very good tennis coaches, Absolutely. but they have a different delivery system. And you have to stay true to your delivery system. If I'm an arms guy, I got to stay true to the arms. Yeah. If I'm a torso guy, I got to stay true to my torso. With me as a sprint coach, I am true to the technique. That's what I want to attack every, every single time my athletes come to the track. Technique is first and foremost. So with me, I'm not looking at the product in terms of creating any type of load that is counterproductive to technique. Um, you know, and another coach may want to, you know, if they're a, a, a hammer thrower coach or, or whatever they may be, you have to be specific to what you're trying to get from the product. And it's best to keep it small when you begin. I mean, with me, and you know, when I was talking to you, I, I said, I need calf sleeves, I need shorts, I need, you know, arms, I need the vest, I need everything, just send it all. Yeah. You know, and then you like, look, you know, you reeled me back a little bit, got me a little bit focused, you know, because it was not so much of how much load I could put on the athlete. It's again, I'm a technical coach. So I wanted to attack the legs. I wanted to attack the arms. I wanted to yeah. attack the lower body. Yeah. I saw what, what, what this product could do for every part of the body, you know, but once we got the product in, it allowed for me to grow slowly. And that was a, a, a big key for me is to be able to grow slow and then be able to kind of uh, imagine in my mind what the product can do for me. And now we can start growing into, into, into some other areas. But it was, it was best for me to start small. Yeah, and, and I think, and, you know, and again, we have a joke in the company when people ask, what's the best product for swimming? Ah, whole suit. What's the best product for golf? Whole suit. <laughs> of course, as a company, you want to do that. But, but what we realized, and again, I spent 35 years, I'm doing this because I'm in coaching and sports science and, and one product, one problem and understand it. And then we can help you look at what will come next because we're already in a world where we're overwhelmed as coaches. The athletes are overwhelmed. We're trying, what you say at the beginning, I want something that I can implement simply. There's already so much going on in that limited practice time that if you, as soon as you move away from that, then we're just doing the same mistake we've learned doesn't work is that we're over coaching, we're overthinking. And, 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 I, and, I, and, and I remember we had that conversation. And I said, well, I asked you, which products would you start with? But you'd never used it. So you were like, I need the tops. I need those arm sleeves. I need this. I need that. And in my mind, I had a picture of all these guys standing around and girls on the track loaded to the guns with these Iron Man suits and just thinking, okay, now what do we do? And then, and, and, and I remember I said, let's start with that cab and shorts. Let's get you some leg kit. I mean, sprinting ultimately, what do they say? You sprint on the legs with the arms and, you know, but, but, but it allowed you to understand the product. So, so let me ask you this. Now we've, we had a conversation a few weeks ago talking about it's off season. We've got that nice time now. Uh, can't share all the secrets, 
but what are you thinking of? Now, you and I have talked about some very specific front end, back end, in-ear mechanical issues. I think it'd be interesting for the audience to hear a little bit of the kind of issues you work on just because they're, without naming specific people, but um, like, what are, what's this next four months? Because you and I are going to start putting together this program over the next while. And what are you thinking now moving in? Because this is actually going to be the first real training block with the product. Pre-Tokyo was kind of the playtime, but now we want to, like you said, we want to work on solutions. Well, the main thing that I'm, I'm going, to, going to go after um, in, in using this product in the fall is being able to help my athletes create more airtime power. You know, the power that you create when you lift the knee up in the ground, uh, lift the knee up off the ground and pull the back leg through. When an athlete is actually in the air, how much force can they create coming back down to the, to the, to the planet, basically? Uh, and I want to be able to use this product to be able to be more uh, efficient and more uh, generating more power in that area. You know, obviously, when we're in the fall, we're building power, we're building speed, we're building that base for all of the things that we want to see in the springtime. So that's one of the main things. The other thing is being able to create, again, and you, we've talked quite a bit, I'm a stickler on knee to ankle movement. I want to be able to create a lot more control with my athletes in terms of what they're doing with that knee to ankle. Um, in the biomechanics world, that's becoming one, the biggest area of gain and the biggest problem that we have. So I want to be the coach coming out in the spring to where my athletes have a better understanding and a better control um, and have that movement work more in their benefit than not. Uh, those are the two things that, that I want to be able to create uh, in, in the fall, in the next four months, moving into the spring. And um, the other thing is I want to grow. And, you know, again, you're my coach when it comes to this. So you can correct <laughs> me if I'm wrong. But, um, you know, I am a, a, a stickler on starts. You know, starts are my thing. And I think with the addition of some certain weights on the arms, because, you know, the arm control is something that's big in starts. You know, some athletes swing them too big. Some of them don't swing them enough. Some of them swing them too straight, too bent. And I want to be able to, you know, and that's an area as a coach that is very, very difficult to, to uh, coach in an athlete because that area of the body moves so fast mm. and it does so many things in a short period of time that the athletes don't even know where their arms mm. are. It's, it's even worse than knee to ankle, mm. you know. But I want to start trying to trickle my coaching into that area so that we can gain more control there. And now I can start to coach that part of the body also. Um, so in short, th those are some of the things that I'm, I'm looking after it, it. They sound quite big, but I think, you know, with your help, we can, you know, be able to uh, master these areas and, and come out better next year than we did this year. Well, uh, exciting. So, you know, that, that next step you and I talked about is me coming on the ground there to be with you in Florida shortly. So, uh, when this when the oh, yeah. webinar is over, I'll, I'll let you know about the update on that. I wonder now, do you think these kind of things are important for team sport athletes as well? When you because this gets highly specific. Obviously, a sprint athlete is worried about that cyclic pattern through a transition from start to finish and over whatever distance. But there's no ball, there's no tackle, there's no stick, there's no shot, there's no defense and offense. But still, you mentioned, you mentioned this in-air power, and I found that a really fascinating area, and I've got some great ideas that we're working with on the track. The knee to ankle mechanics, and even just starts. The difference in team sport is the start and stop happens a lot. Do you think, because right. I, I have a feeling there'll be a lot of college and high school athletes out there, and pro guys listen to this as well from team sport, not just the athletic programs. And also, you know, if you're a high school athlete and you're quick, you're running track, you're playing football, you're playing basketball, you're playing soccer, whatever it is. Uh, do you think these components are important? And, and do you see those things missing sometimes when the athletes come to a senior level? Like just what's your thought on that whole mechanical issue? Although it's a high level thought for you, is it an important mechanical thought for speed in general? Well, I mean, I, I kind of understand the question that you're asking. 
and I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to answer it. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, the answer to your question is simply, you know, coaches in team sports, and I'm a team coach and I'm an individual coach at the same time. You know, I coach individual athletes and in individual uh, uh, events, but I also coach a team. Uh, my athletes are, you know, I'm 13, 14 athletes deep on, on my squad, split between men team. and women. So I got pretty much a basketball team. <laughs> You know, so, you know, my philosophy in terms of teaching that would be this, you know, I'm either going to coach the one to the many or the many to the one. And the way I approach it is I coach the one to the many uh, because I want each and every one of my athletes to feel like they're an individual and the things that they need as an individual, I am qualified and able to give them those things. And once I do that with every single one of my athletes, I'll look up and then I, I look up and see a team. You know, I don't coach the team first and then go down to, sure. you know, my favorite athlete or my best athlete and then coach them. I kind of look as I coach the one athlete to get to the many, right? Uh, but when you're looking at this speed thing in terms of a team, you know, you have to say, okay, the, the components that we need to be fast as a team you know, are all involved in, again, like you said, starting and stopping. Just in a 100-meter sprint, there's 40, well, Usain Bolt did in 38, but most guys go 41, 42 steps in the 100. Right. That's 42 stops and jumps, you know. Um, so all the sports are, are together when it comes to how speed is created, how it's maintained, how it's, it goes from a stop to a start. It's very... Uh, much the same thing, the same approach, you know, but it's in a different sport. It may be lateral, it may be horizontal, but it's all speed, Yeah, you know, but in terms of coaching a team, you know, you have to understand as a coach what you want to achieve. My philosophy is coaching the one to the many, and another coach may be the opposite way or a different approach. But again, you got to be able to, as a coach, you have to get an understanding of what you're trying to coach and how you're trying to coach it. And if you stay true to that, then you know, you'll figure it out. And I'm gonna re-ask re my question, just because it was specific. You see a lot of athletes, because these athletes are, are, are processed up to you, right? Do you get these people at a high level uh, and they've achieved something already. They've come through high school. Some of them might be at that level. Are the things that you see missing in general uh, from a, sort of from the high school, college level that you think, well, by the time these athletes become pro, you're thinking, wow, it would have been good if they worked a little more on this. Do they focus too much on s &C, or is it really different by athlete and program? And in that, is there some general advice you'd give sort of to sprint and speed coaches in the college and high school athlete on those key things that as a, as a professional coach, what you'd like to see as they come into your program? Right. Well, for me, I don't, I don't want to insult anyone no, you know, no, no, it's in not terms that. of, you know, what they're coaching. So, you know, the things I say, they're not going to be said in, in an insulting type of manner. Um, but at my level, um, the things that I see, and again, I'm a technical coach. Those are the things that I go after. Those are the first things that I look at. Um, but I see that, you know, going through the process of coaching from high school to college to now us, the pros, the athletes they have the prerequisites to be fast. I mean, these athletes are some of the fastest athletes in the history of the world. So we can't, you know, do away with how fast they are, but how they get there is a different story. You know, it's like, you know, these coaches now are teaching the easy stuff, you know, the easy, get yourself in shape, run a lot of track meets or compete a lot. And then by attrition, we'll see who's good and who's not. Um, and there's a few of them out there that are coaching, you know, the technical things, you know, teaching an athlete why they run fast. You know, those things are, you have to be a little bit more insightful as a coach in order to, to, to get those things. And as we, and, and these are my compadres too, you know, we always talk about that technical aspect is just not trickling up to us. And when we get the athletes, we kind of have to go backwards in order to go forwards. You know, because power, strength, 
uh, endurance, all those things are easy to get. You can just run them around the track and send them to a weight room, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, being able to spend the time with these athletes to show them, you know, while you're running fast, like for instance, Shakari Richardson is the best technical athlete I've ever coached. And she's probably the best technical athlete all my other fellow coaches has ever seen. Wow. You know, she's a once in a generation type of athlete, but I didn't teach her that technique. That's something that she learned, you know, um, you know, naturally it's her natural running form. You know, I didn't teach that to her. Mm -hmm. So once I get her or I got her um, and I recognize that her, her technique is almost flawless, you know, before she even got to me, you know, the thing that I had to concentrate on is teaching her how or why it's her technique is good teaching her how to use it as a weapon when she is in a, a, a pickle, when someone's, you know, racing beside her or whatever, learn teaching her the ins and outs of why biomechanically she's a great athlete. That's our challenge between the both of us is the educational part of how she is the athlete that she is. Um, so we spend less time on the technical aspect and more time on why that technique is successful for her. That's our challenge, and that's where our growth is going to come from. Yeah, it's and I wish that I had more athletes coming to me that were in that range. Of course, who doesn't? You know, if you had, it'd be kind of <laughs> nice to have a, a dozen, tw ten, seven uh, runners with your on your program. You know, it's. Um, but Thank yeah, you, I mean, man. It, it, it's an important point you said. It's like, especially when they come to pro level, an athlete doesn't go to a pro level. They're the one percent of the one percent. And, and they're all fast. And I think, you know, we all see that is even a fast athlete, the coaches at young development areas have to make them realize why they're fast, why that's working. Are they, you know, is it technical? Is it power? Where it's coming from? Because no matter how fast or how good you are, there's something you're not good at. There's something you need to improve at because you can't just say we're going to, and I say this all the time is your strengths never hold you back but they're not the things that move you forward. It's building your weaknesses that builds you, moves you forward. You know, your strengths got you here and, but they don't, you can't just keep saying, Oh, we're going to do more of that. And, and I think when we get frustrated as coaches, we often do that. We go back to basics or we try and redo that again. And, and, and that really kind of gets you to the same place or maintains you. And, um, and it has to be a growth experience, right? It has to be a learning experience. And, and that's not always easy to do. And I do think, that exogen provides an ability to learn a new dimension of what's going on with the body. Um, I share a little thought with you and then get you to, cause we're gonna wrap up here and go to some questions and answers here in a second. We had a Texas Rangers baseball coach, a uh, pitcher. And we were talking about loading and I was there at the training session with them. And we were talking about loading through the arm and you know throwing weighted balls and how weighted balls are heavy. Like you said, they're distal, it's far away. All the control needs to be here, but the weighted ball kind of screwed with that. He liked this loading, but he said one of the things he liked most about the product was loading his rear leg. And, he, and, I, and I said, well, tell me about that. And this was just 100% high level biomechanics skill. And, and again, I had no idea about this. I'm not a pitching coach. So he said, well, he's about a six foot four, six foot five guy. He was a big heat thrower. He's a 98, 99 mile an hour guy. And, you know, he had the mechanics and the length to do that. And he was talking about release points. You know, the closer I can release the ball to the batter, the less time the batter has to think, even by inches, right? But also the more, the later I can release, the more control I have, the more I can hide what I'm doing. They just want to get that release as close to the batter as possible. And he said, that release point in the front is determined by what my back leg is doing. But he said, I never know what my back leg's doing because I can't feel it. And he said, one day when I had the product, I just put the calf sleeves on the shorts and I put a small load on the back of the hamstring, the back on the calf, and I pitched. And it, all of a sudden that back leg went up and I immediately knew where my back leg was. And I was aware it was too bent. I aware it was going too high. I aware, I, now I understood what my pitching coach was trying to get me to do with that leg, but I'd never been able to feel it before. And so he wasn't putting the weight on there for power or speed or anything. He was putting it so he had something on him that kind of cued him to motion. And that became, the funny thing is, he was using it for power and rotation. But the most significant change in his technique came from understanding where that back leg was. 
And that was the whole issue that his skills coach, his pitching coach was working on with him. And you talked about, you know, keep it simple. What are you working on? What's your problem? How are you going to address that? And it had nothing to do with heavy weight, power, or load. I mean, this guy's almost throwing 100 miles an hour. His issue is not speed. His issue is control now. It was finesse. And just, just a little thought on that, how we lose. Because my, my area is a conditioning coach. I spent years training athletes, and we did a lot of power stuff. We got squats, up, bench press, cleans. And athletes would go to competition, and their times wouldn't change. They wouldn't win. They're way fitter, but performance wasn't changing. And I really rethought my whole field about, well, how can I contribute to you winning? How can I contribute to your technique? That's what my job should be, not just making you stronger. You know, and it's just a much more integrated system. And I thought maybe you can make some comment on this because now that I've created this exogen, I think this is my contribution. Giving a tool with weight training that's going to contribute to things that can actually help performance once you have that base. Because another question we get asked is people say, oh, well, so you do this training, you don't need squats anymore, you don't need cleans, you don't need that. This is a replacement. I say, no, it, it's about knowing the tools in the box. And maybe you could just share your thoughts on where wearable resistance as a tool sort of fits in the coaches or trainers box. Well, you know, I've been kind of saying that the whole time we've been talking and you kind of hit the nail on the head again, you know, talking about the baseball player and the point that you made that sparked with me again is that you have the athlete being able to communicate now something to a coach that they hadn't been able to communicate before yeah. because they couldn't connect to what the coach was actually asking them to feel or telling them to feel or telling them to do. But now with the wearable, you're able to have that athlete make that connection. That's critical in, in my field, you know, because like I said, the things that I'm going after as a coach are the areas where athletes aren't neuromuscularly connected to yeah. on a large scale. So I'm trying to kind of reeling that back and being able to get the majority of my athletes, if not all of them, to be able to connect with those things. Now, all of a sudden, I've created another coaching environment for myself. Yeah. Now, I got a choice as a coach. Either I'm going to go there or I'm not. You know, and I'm one of the coaches that, you know, once I create that I guess you could call it a problem, then I'm going in there, you know, and we're going to make it a, a find a solution to it. And the problem is, is that it's a good thing. The problem is, is that now the athlete is aware. So now once the athlete becomes aware, now I got to get, pull some tools out of my bucket to be able to help make that communication, make that connection, something that is viable to the athlete, like you said, to win. And that's our whole goal as coaches is to try to get our athletes to, if not compete well, but to win. We're in the business of winning. And, you know, this product puts us in that environment. This, in, you know, the, the things that we can achieve through the wearables that you've created is, is the secret weapon. It really is. Yeah. You know, because, again, if, if, if we as coaches – you know, dive into this, it creates a whole nother environment for us to be able to live, you know, and, and all the things that you name, like lifting weights and, you know, running around the track and, you know, pulling this and jumping this and doing all these things, those are the big things, you know, but there's never been anything created for us to be able to work on the little things and the little things in today's sports are the big issues, yeah. are the things that separate the good coaches from the bad coaches, the great athletes from the okay ones, the medals from no medals, yeah. you know, so, yeah. you know, hopefully the coaches, you know, on this call will be able to get an understanding that, you know, this is something that could separate you from the other ones. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's exciting because we are getting smarter. And I, and the word that keeps coming up with me is this product is intuitive. And that's what makes the difference now. Like you said, as soon as you put it on, it, it, it helps that feeling. And, and you're right. There's no good coaching something if the athlete's not aware, one, of the problem, and two, of the need to change. I'm sure a lot of people listening will be speed, sprint coaches, high school, college level. 
any other um, exciting things or a little bit of advice for them moving forward coming in the 2022 season? Just from a, a legend and a very good coach? Well, I mean, you know, being able to, to talk to other coaches and give them advice, it's, it's difficult because you're not in their world, you know. But the main thing that I guess that I could say, you know, is be true to what you know. You know, if you're a coach and you're good at something, just try to be the best at it. You know, I'm not the best weight training coach. You know, I'm not the best endurance coach, but my forte is starts and speed in speed. And I spend a lot of time trying to be the best at what I can be in those areas and continue to learn in, in those other areas. Again, we've had a consistent thing here of keeping things simple. You know, and it, and it rings true in coaching too. Keep your coaching simple. You know, stay true to the things that you're really good at and continue to learn and progress in the things that you're not. And, you know, eventually your, your athletes will be in a better training environment. You'll coach more relaxed and everybody will be better for it. You know, but don't try to do too much, you know, too fast. And, and that's my advice to coaches and athletes who are looking at the product and they're saying, like you at the start, I need this, I need this, I need this. And I said, yes, you do, but not at the start. And so for any coaches that are listening and your speed is your game, the legs is where it's, what does it say? The legs feed the wolf, right? Those calf sleeves and shorts. Yeah. Would, you, would you agree that's, that's the right place to start for most people working on speed? Yes, yeah. I, would, I would say start there. And honestly, I can tell you that it's going to spark your interest in other things. You know, so mm -hmm. if you start there, trust me, you'll grow from there. Yeah, exactly. So we're going we're gonna to stop here on the pre-record. We're going to jump into live uh, question and answers. And um, then uh, let's see what people want to want to ask you. Let's do it. All right. Hey, Coach, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. How you doing? Yeah, good. And I see we've got uh, Sharif is here. Yeah. Hey, Sharif, how are you? I'm good, just doing a little bit of moving around, so I won't hear from me that much, but I'm on here. Good, good, good. Well, uh, uh, hopefully I'll see you there in Florida soon enough. We're still trying to figure out, um, as I said, down the chat group, we're going to be planning an on-the-ground on session with your coach and learning a little bit more on the ground and talking about exogen and wearable resistance and sprint training. But Canada is going back into lockdown, and um, all of a sudden, all my flight plans in the last 24 hours have seemed to sort of take a little bit of dive and a quarantine issues and I'm like oh you know just before <laughs> Christmas so um but we'll figure that out separately I'm now um to send it. I'm just uh so uh, as for questions ready to send it. hold on we've got a lot of questions here coach um and then we'll jump right in so we're going to do uh okay. like I said we'll just start reading them out there it says recommendations for load uh, placement for specific training goals. Now, one thing, coach, I mean, like I said, we've started training with it. You've had a play. You've seen some value. Uh, is there a general comment on that? Uh, because just for people to know, I've already put together a very straightforward, and it's the one I sent to you. It's kind of the five main loading problems for sprinting, you know, posture, hip engagement, rotation, open or closing stride. And I think those are good places that sort of center around key issues in running mechanics. And if people start there, they tend to then start to figure out the product. But is there right. now, because we talked about like, you know, work on a problem, pick something that you're working on, know your issue and work on that. Don't try and do everything else. Uh, what were your th uh, thoughts on anything specific you, you're looking at? Again, you mentioned, uh, you know, that in-air mechanics, but just any recommendations for load and placement right now? I mean, I think it's going to come later, but let's hear from you. Well, like I said before, the main thing is to start real simple, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, start with a very light load. And it's going to depend on what kind of movement that you're actually really working on, first of all. Um, so if you're doing something holistic, like just a regular sprint, you know, I would say, you know, we're going to start with some hip flexor loading and uh, start very light and let the athlete be the one to tell you whether they can feel the weight um, you know, whether it's too heavy or too light, but I would say work from the light to the heavy as opposed from the heavy to the light. And you'll get kind of confused because the, the actual weights, all of them are relatively light once you hold them in your hand. 
But once you put them on your body in certain places, it really affects running mechanics. So you have to be able to, I, I think, start lighter as opposed to heavier. Yeah, well, I'm holding them. Now I'm holding what would be you know, almost nothing, 400 grams here, which is uh, eight, 16 ounces. This is a pound and you can put that around the body. And a pound doesn't sound a lot in a weight training world, right? It's, it's the smallest dumbbell in any gym in the world and not many people in sports touch that dumbbell. But take that 400 grams and put it on the lower shank at high speed movement and it's a very different feeling. And because yes, it is. It's, it is. it's not just the load on the body that's affecting high, sort of specific speed or strength, but it's it, mechanics are affected. And so you want the mechanical or the technical effect to be in sync with the conditioning. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's, and you've, you've now had the chance to experience that because I remember you had all those same questions in those first calls. I, I did. I did. And maybe Sharif, was there anything you saw the same thing, you know, again, uh, getting the product when you, because Sharif is uh, assistant coach to Coach Green, and he's, um, uh, 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 sorry, Coach Dennis, Dennis and, um, and, and you had maybe had some experience too. What, did it end up being a little heavier than you thought it was going to be once they used it? Sharif, you're on mute, by the way. <laughs> so if you did have something. Yeah, yeah I, got, I got a lot going on in the background, so I didn't want all the background noise. But yes, yeah, it's, it's what we kind of expected how what you talked uh, to us about that we wouldn't need as much weight to get all the results that we were looking for right and and you said something interesting in the webinar you said they responded to the kit overall well but they responded to the weight very well can you expand on that a bit because i think that's kind of an important point well the thing that we saw immediately in the athletes when they got this equipment you know, they're athletes and they want to lift a lot. They want to run a lot, you know, and, you know, they didn't understand grams, you know. So when you give them the wearable, you know, they were like, OK, I'm going to put as many of these weights on my legs as I possibly can, you know, because that's what's going to help me. You know, so we kind of had to reel them back a little bit and say, look, let's start over here and then we'll move forward. But once they did one stride with the lighter weight, they came back very humble and said, okay, I see what you're talking about now. Yeah. You know, yeah. so the athletes, you know, you got to kind of, you know, cause, cause they're gung ho and they want to lift a lot of weights. Cause that in their mind is success when I can move a lot of weight, you, you know, know, but with this, it's a more of a specific thing. And, and, and for anybody listening right now, and, and this is what happens, even it, like I'm working with a couple of elite sprinters, many programs around the world, like yours, but we've got a bunch of these master's level elite sprinters. And I've got a couple of guys out of the West Coast of Canada that, and people get really wrapped up in overcomplicating what they're working on. People are like, well, I've got my starts and then my hip engagement and I want to do this. And I, even when I give them the suggestion for the program and I talk to them two weeks later, they've already confused it. You know, we're again, we're already, it, we're, we're so used to, like you said, thinking heavy, trying to do it all at the same time. And I think it's just like one thing I've seen working with programs, the, the, the smarter the coach, the quicker they start to simplify what they do with the product. And, and, yeah. you, were, and you were doing that within two days, you know, and like, yeah. I, and you, like you said, I get it and I know what you mean. We've now felt it. I see that. So this is what I want to do. And I can see with, with people with little less experience, they're sort of, they're getting wrapped up in, well, now I want, you know, this week I want to work on arms. And, and I'm like, well, you didn't even have a training block with your hips yet. And that's, that's the big issue. And so I just think it really hits the point, as you said, pick a product, pick a problem, get familiar with it, work through that, and then you'll grow from that. Correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, we, we are not working with every, every product that you have, but what we do have, it is sparking my interest to be able to think on how I can incorporate things as we move forward in our training. Because one of the points you just kind of kind of got to is that, you know, if you're not doing these things consistently, then, you know, they're not going to work. Yeah, they don't, you know, so familiar. you have to kind of exactly. And you have to be able to, as a coach, incorporate these things, these things into your training to where they become a, a commonplace thing, yeah, you know, um, you know, so so to be able to start things a little bit slower helps you be able to, you know, get your mind wrapped around where you want to move with the product. 
And I, and, and, and one thing I've seen now with years of experience with this, with the lead programs is it tends to be, and it's almost a universal period. And you're going to discover this too. And some athletes move a little quicker if it's an awareness issue, but when we have technical problems, we generally see that a four week block makes it permanent. So what would happen is this, you'll, you'll, you'll say it's a stride issue or an engagement, whatever it might be a start issue with a hip engagement in the right arm pattern. So we'll see it and we'll start loading. And for the first week or two, they're just struggling with the load, no matter how level, how high they are, right? They're getting used to it. And some adapt quick, some don't. But you, like you said, you need consistency for your neuromuscular system to actually develop specific strength, specific speed to that load and adaptation. And then what we see is after about four weeks for fairly elite level athletes, certainly the sprinters, when we take that load off and you actually walk down to a session and say, all right, we're not loading today. We're not going to cue you on anything. I just want to see those starts. And now we'll start to see the first signs of permanent, permanent sort of change. And this is another thing I sort of just let people know is like you need exactly what you said you need consistency. Because the other thing that you saw that happens with the product is there's an acute response and people think the acute response. Oh, I've, I've, I've done something now, but that's gone 24 hours later. You know, they put the load on, then all of a sudden they're like, oh, coach, wow, I, my knees are engaged. That felt really cool. But that's not a training effect. That's a, that's right. a proprioceptive effect. And, and maybe just like, I just wanted to make the point, you need that consistency. And one thing we see, as you know, you don't do one day training blocks. You know, you've got four weeks, six, eight, 12 weeks that you work on issues. And it's no different with something like exogen. So I, I think it's important people don't let the, the acute effect make them think something's happened because right. your, your guys would have seen that acute effect. Correct. That, that's exactly right. You know, but it was, it was my job, you know, as their coach to be able to, you know, teach them that, Hey, yeah, this first day you felt something really great and you, you, you mentally got a gain out of it, but we have to do it consistently. We have to do it throughout all of our training blocks so that this can be something that is instilled in your body to where when you get to a track meet and you want to you want to perform that you don't have to think about that movement it, that it's it, just going to be there for you yeah 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 so i think that really that's that first question and to be honest i kind of went on with that one because anybody who's new the other thing you've got to understand is every question that we see here that people want to know these are all the questions that coach had before he got the product about two to five ten, a week later once he's played with the product i think you've kind of answered most of your own questions right that's, that's absolutely true, you know, because, you know, when you see the product, you know, you have this great amount of one curiosity about it. And two, you know, you, you start to think about all these things you can do with it, you know, but once you start using it, you really start to hone in on what you can actually do and what you can actually get out of it. So the more you use it, the more you kind of settle in, you know, with where you want to go with the product. Yeah, like, you know, and I always use that comparison. Remember the first time you got an iPhone or a smartphone, you didn't know 10% of the features in that thing. But think what you were doing with it three months later. You know, so that, you know, so again, you got to get in your hand, you got to start to play. And there's another specific question here. And I think this is a really good one. Uh, how do you in integrate the program with other resistive work, like sleds, maybe the 1080? Maybe. And then, of course, there was I know who wrote this question has already got complicated and also leading to indoor <laughs> and outdoor season. Now it's just become, geez, that's a whole PhD on training. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but, but just the integration. Now we get a lot of and one thing I said in the chat is none of the coaches that have worked with at a very high level start with exogen on and a 1080 and a sled on the first session. And even though we have videos like we saw there, Su Bing Tian, you know, who's now the golden boy of Asian sprinting, and he's been with us for almost two years. We've done a lot of work. And some of the clips showed him uh, pulling the 1080 plus exogen. It took those coaches 48 months to get there. They didn't start there. Now, you haven't gone there yet, but what do you think about, what do you see right now? You've got enough experience to, to take a guess. Do you think that's overcomplicating it right now? Or do you see some value to doing that down the road? How would you, how do you think you're going to approach that? Well, we're definitely going to incorporate it into our training. Now we do two, two we pull sleds, yeah. um, just to let everybody know. Um, now we pull sleds and we also push sleds, right? But the main thing that I'm using the, the pants for is 
and we touched on this when we were talking before, is about that airtime movement. Right. You know, the sled is effective once the foot hits the ground and how you push, right? But the exogen helps me deal with what the athlete is doing when the step, when your foot leaves the ground to the right. time where it lands on the ground. The rotary component, right? The right, rotary, yeah. right. So, so I'm not using exogen to assist with the sleds. Mm. There are two separate training things that I'm looking at gaining from you know, and from an area that I could only really do it with one. So it's just adding in something and not, you know, being a plus to the, uh, to the sled, if I can explain that properly. Yeah. So I'm working on the airtime with the exogen and working on the push aspect with the sled. And I, I have a feeling that was something very similar to like, you know, Randy Huntington, those videos we had earlier, those were with Randy. And of course, you know, Randy, he was with U.S. He's a legend coach from yeah, the track and field. And he's been over there with China Olympic Council, a big part of Su Bing Chen's success. And he approached us also, I think about two years ago now. Um, but again, I'm sure like you saw him, he was working on the woodway on the motorless uh, treadmill, working on that high speed acceleration motion at angles for takeoffs. But I can promise you, they didn't start on day one with that. And again, right. and the other thing that I think is important is you said this at the beginning, those athletes you've got, they're, whether they come to you young and talented, they're the best of the best. So they're integrating things quicker, right? They're able to process things quicker. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, if you're one thing I get, if you're a recreational athlete or an amateur elite, and you're coming up, complicating the issue doesn't help. You know, I think it's better, like you said, pick things simple. If you're trying to work the sled and you're trying to work other items at the same time, you can confuse that athlete pretty quickly. So it's just, I think it, 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 my suggestion would be from what I've seen is I would still start simple, pick a problem and work through it. And once you do that, like you said, I think coaches and athletes, once they've really had a good training block and say, all right, exogen work for this. Now I can think of something else. Is that a fair statement? I mean, you did that with the 1080 and sleds, you know, you've seen tech come at you for the last 20, 30 years, you know, yeah. I'm sure exogen is not the first thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me in, in working with this, and, and I want to kind of reiterate something you just said, is that when you get this product, and just say I'm bringing this product in to help my athletes. Well, in my coaching day or coaching week, you know, we're doing starts, we're doing some sprints, we're doing some speed endurance, we're doing a mixture of a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. But you got to understand that once you put one of these wearables on, that teaching that start is different now because the, the athlete is gonna respond differently than if they weren't having a wearable on. Right, right. So your coaching environment now is different. So you have to adapt to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you're trying to bring a wearable in to get an athlete, for instance, to have a lower dry phase, right? There's, there's a difference between, you know, them having, you know, several grams on or 500 grams on their hip flexors coming out of a block than if they didn't right so you got to understand that just by putting that wearable on you've changed the environment so you gotta you know up your game a little bit when it comes to your coaching because you're coaching in a new environment and not the same one you had before you had the wearable that's and that's pretty amazing right i mean that's what we're trying to do we're trying to move the thing forward i remember a guy who was from Exos, you know, people know Exos very well out of uh, the U.S. They're, they've done a great job uh, in the education area. They were they did a lot in the NFL draft. And he was Nick Winkleman, who's a well-known sort of speed, team speed and, and educator in the field, in our field. And he said to me, he said, I can probably reduce my coaching, the conversation coaching about 50 percent with this. But now I have to do now I have to know what to do with that other time. And it was exactly what you were describing. My coaching process will change with this. And, and so, again, it's a little because we're tweaking movement, we're not just, like you said, working on power and force, which I think we kind of understand at a pretty high level now. Like we've had sleds for a couple of decades, right? We've had those resistance tools for a while now. And so most coaches aren't confused where to start. But I remember when they first came out, nobody, first thing, nobody knew whether to push them or pull them. You know, and, you know, and, 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 and people were talking and at their early issue, everybody said they weren't going to help because the angles were wrong. 
but later we started to realize, well, there are angles in sprinting as well. You know, so like I said, I think people just have to, I would still recommend if you want to work this stuff in to other areas, as coach said, it's going to change your environment. So you got to be ready for that, but don't overcomplicate the issue. And if you're an elite coach, I think you've already seen enough tech to know how to do that. Is that fair enough? Fair statement? That's true. Yeah. Now let's move on. We got time for one more question here in this group chat. And then we've got another uh, group waiting to have a, a, a chat with you. Um, was wondering, was there any place for standardized workouts and training progressions for speed and track athletes? Oh, this is another tough one. I have been mostly looking at science studies and testing to see what works. But is there a program or a recommended guide that would help? I think that's just somebody who's struggling trying to find you know the holy grail source of information for speed but are there some specific places for you that you've seen online i i think it's a good question for people in general that you recommend coaches go other than uh, check out uh, green machine and mean machine <laughs> you know? but um no but are, are there stuff or maybe sharif you know are there specific portals you guys like i know uh, simply faster is a great one you know they've got they've been doing tons of stuff in that area so whoever's been asking that if you if you spend some time on Simply Faster, I think they tend to vet some pretty good information. But I'm not sure if you if you've got places. Do you get asked that question a lot? Well, I mean, I I, I guess I kind of at, at our level, you know, we have certain people that we go to. Yeah. You know, we have certain biomechanic biomechanical guys that are in USA Track and Field that we draw our information from. Right. So you know we're a little bit different because we don't have to go out and source these things. They're always available to us. The information is always available to us. But at the end of the day, you know, what you need to focus in on are what are the basics? You know, if, if you're trying to be a sprint coach, the basic formula for running is out there. It's, you know, it's on the internet. It's easy, easily accessible. It's not so much the information, it's your delivery system. You know, everybody has basically the same information available to them when it comes to, to coaching. You know, it's just how you develop it as a coach. You know, you can get 10,000 different types of apparatus in your training day, you know, but where are you going with it? What are you trying to do with it is the issue. And again, I said this when we were talking before, is that kind of stuff is what separates, you know, good coaches from great coaches. You know, yeah. is is are is the fact that you're able to, you know, not so much possess the knowledge, but how do you pass that knowledge on to your athletes? How do they, you know, receive that information that you give to them and then be able to use it in a competitive setting? That's the key, you know. Um, and, and we've been talking over and over and over again about keeping things simple. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in a coaching philosophy. You know, everybody thinks that, okay, just because you're a, a, a high level, Olympic level coach and you got a bunch of medals and all this kind of stuff, that you got some kind of secret plan. It's really not. It's just that our athletes at our level, you know, receive the information and we're able to teach it to them in, in a, a much more efficient way than other coaches may. You know, what one of the older coaches tells me all the time, he says, you know, you, you found the holy grail kind of thing. You know, because if you break the code on how to coach well, then your athletes are going to compete well. You know, so he always tells me this and tries to keep me motivated. Um, you know, he says, Dennis, you, you know, you're in the pipe, man. You're, you're doing it. You're getting it done. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me be able to, one, not try to bring in a whole bunch of other things or other ideas. It's trying to hone better in what I'm doing. Because if you're successful at what you're doing, then you just kind of got to get better with that. Yeah, and it just gets better and better and better. And you start, you know, you realize, exactly. ah, I might not do that next year. I think we've got some better ways to do that, right? But but the yes. basic, the yes. founder, and I have a feeling if somebody went down and watched you coach, they wouldn't say, oh my God, these guys are running on their hands and they're doing somersaults now. And, you know, they're diving <laughs> from airplanes. It's a whole new technique. They would see sprint training and speed training like most good coaches are doing but the devil would be in the detail and that's what they would that's what they wouldn't see you know they wouldn't understand you know and, and that's a that's exactly right 
you know, um, when I was coming up, you know, I had coaches um, and I and I had a good group of coaches that were mentoring me and they taught me basically everything that they know. But the best piece of advice that I had, and this is just for track coaches, the best piece of advice that I had is that one of my fellow coaches told me, he said, Dennis, I will tell you everything that I have in my book as a coach. But one thing that you won't do is you won't beat me, excuse my language, you won't beat me with my own shit. You know, because <laughs> yeah. he understood, he, was, he understood yeah. that it's the delivery system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the workout. And then he came back and he said, either way, every coach in every country, in every city, in every town only has 400 meters to work with. Yeah. We all have the same tools. And two legs. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So yeah. there's there's no secret. It's no yeah. secret there. It's all it's all about the delivery. That's what it's about. Right. And I think for that person who made that comment and was looking for that, I think it sounds like they're doing the right thing. They're going online, they're finding programs, they're doing the research. I think they just need to be a little more satisfied. Like, you know, I found a good program. This person seems to be pretty good. Let me try that for a while. And within the program, you learn. And then right. at the, and at the end of it, you'll turn around and realize, yeah, he was good, but I think I'm going to look for something more now. And mate, that's how we all learned, right? Over time. Yeah, that's right. So I've got one more real quick question, just because it's a specific one. I have a track athlete that their stride crosses. I've read some of the studies on how to fix movement patterns. Where would you recommend I load them to fix and feel the crossing of this stride? Also, I only have the calf sleeves. I can answer this very specifically. 100%. If their leg is crossing over, then what you need to get is some version of lateral or lateral rotation or abduction. And what that means is put the loads on the outside of the body. So on your calf sleeves, get those loads on the outside of the calf down low and have them work that because when that leg swings through, it'll be with a load with the calf on the outside or with the load on the outside, it is very difficult for that leg to cross. They would have to actively pull that leg in. And that'll help them feel the right pattern. Let them work with that as a starting position. Um, because they already have the calf sleeves. And for whoever wrote that question, and you're listening now, you could email me and I could talk to you a little bit more about it. But I don't know, Coach, is there anything else you've got about that? You've seen this before. That's just a specific. Yeah, yeah. You're exactly right. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we're going to close this down now. We're going to jump into, uh, we're going to close this session. So just real quickly, um, we have a VIP elite session going on with several coaches with you now. Uh, we're going to jump in for 15 minutes with them. We're going to close this down. But before I do that, uh, we need to just thank you for joining the session. Sharif, thanks for joining as well. And of course, we need to thank Dwayne Miller, who, of course, is was LaShawn Merritt's coach who connected us. And, and uh, yep, that's my guy. Yeah, he's your guy. <laughs> right? and, and when he got this all set, now here we are later uh, and doing great things um, for all those listening there is going to be an email coming out and then in that email we're going to send you a video clips that show you how to load for the five major issues a little bit on posture rotation stride and hip engagement to get you started and there is uh another sprint video for putting sprint uh, exogen into your warm-ups and there'll be also a link and some information on if you want to get a starter kit and uh some discounts and whatnot that are coming as a result of you joining this uh, webinar and like I said, we'll be doing a part two on the ground, hopefully as soon as I can get over there to the ground. Um, but stay tuned. We're going to close this down. For everybody who's listened, thanks very much. And as always, reach out. Uh, I'm always available, as, as Coach knows. And I love to chat anything sport and uh, exogen. So let's close this down. And, we'll, and then uh, Coach will jump into that other link. All right, guys. Thanks so much.